session. It will be moderated by Dr. Maddox and Eric Lenore. Dr. Maddox is a professor in the HRWD program and avid podcaster and the idea person behind today's event. Eric is a current HRWD master's student with over 30 years of experience in corporate training and instructional design. And Eric was also very modest when he wrote his bio for me. So I want you all to know that he was instrumental in today's events. He was responsible for many of the amazing speakers we have had today. He made the Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield grant happen, uh, sponsorship, and he was also a huge part in the We Care Grant Fund. So I want to make sure Eric gets the point. Thank you. I'm gonna... So our concurrent session speakers, uh, many of you have already met, but we couldn't be in all the sessions. So first I want to remind everybody that the sessions were recorded. So if you go online, you can see the other sessions that you didn't have a chance to attend. And the ones that I attended obviously were fantastic. So I'm sure all of them were. But I want to just very quickly uh, reintroduce our panelists for those of you that did not get a chance to meet everyone. Dr. Ainur Charkasova is a teaching assistant professor at the HRWD program. Dr. Mandy Gosney is a graduate of, of this university's HRWD doctoral program and currently serves as vice president of organizational development and learning services for youth health. And this is not in the order that they're seated. Anyway, so I'm asking them to raise the same. <laughs> Judith Tavano wears many hats and serves as a development specialist at the University of Arkansas, is a small business owner, a veteran in the workplace advocate. Thank you as a veteran. Uh, Thank you. And a former instructor and director of professional development at the University of Arkansas. Sarah Bitka is founder and principal consultant at Orchid Communications and executive in residence in the Department of Communication at the University of Arkansas. And then Cassie Hardaway currently serves at Blue Cross Blue Shield as a servant leader with a passion for learning, development, and helping others realize their potential and achieve their goals. So thank you, panelists, for attending. And Dr. Maddox, what is the first question we have for our esteemed panelists? If you could be a car. Wrong <laughs> set of questions. These these are completely unscripted questions. Eric and I just made these up just now. <laughs> it's like a reality show. <laughs> and I tell you a pretty little secret here. Yes. These questions, I I, I submitted 45 questions, 15 in each category. Uh, to Dr. Maddox and the team and asked them to move them down to their top five in each category. And then I submitted them all to the panelists and asked them to identify their top three. All of these questions came from chat GPT. Uh-huh. <laughs> chat GPT, Give, what are the top 15 questions asked uh, a team of people that are specialists in their field about one of these three subjects? And these questions were what came up. Scary. Very. <laughs> and we'll be using chat GPT for our answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, first question. How do you measure the success of a training program and determine its impact on the organization? You want to, sorry, who, uh, who, who wants to? So we had, uh, we, uh, let's see. Um, Dr. Sarkisova, that was one of your favorite questions. Would you like to start us off? Yes, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> how, how do you measure the success of a training program and determine its impact on the organization? What are your thoughts? I think the industry people should answer. No. I, I'm happy to do so. How about that? Uh, uh, we'll get us it, it has to start with uh, with business objectives, right? It's uh, to borrow a very old Steve Covey phrase. You begin with the end in mind. So you've got to identify the, uh, what what are you what are you intending? What rock are you to, intending to move? What impact are you intending to have? And then to build a program that solves the the state of problem. Uh, what is implied in that? Uh, and I think what's implied in that question is oftentimes training and development organizations uh, will fail uh, to build programming that solves problems, but instead they build programming that that uh, 
fluffs their own ego, right? Look how long our list of training and development initiatives are, or, uh, offerings or course listings are that we've created. And uh, that will end in disaster for, uh, for corporate training. Uh, if if the only way you justify your existence is by the list of uh, courses that you're running, uh, then you will not be long. Uh, instead, if you can generate uh, courses that uh, each one speak to an identified need in terms of development, in terms of strategy, in terms of growth, a uh, metric identified, I mean, that's the ideal, a metric identified that you're trying to influence, uh, then it will be successful and you will create need in your organization. And I think I'd add to that that you want to also look to see whether or not the training has transferred back into the work sure. that those individuals who have been through your training programs are exhibiting what it is that you took from the needs the organization has presented in the objectives that you've set. And are they then able to take that and apply it back on the job? That smiley sheet isn't sufficient. That so smiley she, sheet is not sufficient. Otherwise, employees will be just think that this training is a waste of money at their clients if they're not going to apply right to their At Tyson, we, and in my prior organization, we looked at everything they've just talked about. And the application of that is you have to have that experiential piece of did it feel good, track the smiley sheet. That's just step one to their point. But then We've also taken it into these impact surveys, what we're calling them. And then six, nine, 12 months, depending after the program, it's evaluating with them and their leader on the behavior changes that they've had since attending the program. We've also looked at 360 uh, assessments that are done pre and about 12 months post program as well to actually compare that and show the data to the business because they want the numbers to actually show. If I may piggyback on that, so inside our organization, um, a key driver for us then is in the application, to your point, is that over time we'll see changes in culture, we'll see changes in our engagement survey data, right? So if I have a leader going through a course or a, a, an offering around, you know, leading with emotional intelligence, right, then over time, uh, if I'm requiring all managers, for example, to take that, then we should see that engagement engagement survey that those numbers are trending up more and more. It's interesting you're identifying level three and level four for Patrick. And what about that level five or getting to ROI measurements that in the Phillips model, for example? Um, do you find any resistance to measuring at those higher levels in an organization? And if so, how do you address them? Usually find resistance to paying Jack Phillips to come and teach us how to do it. <laughs> That's the most <laughs> resistance that we find. Uh, it's that is so hard to get to uh, that. I think you're setting your organization up for failure if that's the only way that you can uh, justify the education and learning is by you know, space working through uh, the Jack Phillips model. There are times and places for it. Uh, and it should not be your go-to. That's a good segue into the second most, actually the, the most popular question in this category. How do you ensure training and development initiatives align with the overall business strategy and goals? I'll, t I'll start on that one. So um, inside our organization, we have set levels of competencies that should be uh, exhibited or displayed based upon your level of leadership, right? Um, and then those things from time to time are revisited based upon what our company goals are, right? Um, and I think what drives us overall is our mission, our vision, our values, right? Um, because if we don't have that, if we have leaders who are doing things that are against that, then that gets us into things like uh, HR investigations, EEOC complaints, right? Those sorts of things that we do so much to avoid having to go down that route. Um, so in the work that I do, equipping the leaders with the right type of skills, knowledge, and ability is what helps us uh, to meet those overall goals of the business. I'll jump in. I think everything has to start with values. So I think a lot of times we go into training because say, here's a problem learning how to 
So for those of you who just watched my session, you're going to do repetition, right? We start with that kind of logic framework of here's the problem when we're trying something, but we don't take the time to connect it to the overall values of the organization. And you know, my space of narrative, narrative is driven by repetition, inconsistency, coherence. So to your point, if that narrative of the values is not being lived out in the purpose of your trainings and your employees can tell people after the training, you know, that meeting after the training or the conversation in the middle of the training, it's like, what the heck are we doing here? I don't understand the point, it's taking up too much time, right? Then you're never going to get to the, this higher level metrics there. So always has to lead with values, connecting that training to the higher objectives. And then making sure you've scripted out experiences that reinforce the stories that people are going to say and tell everyone after that training. Yeah, to put on the OD hat instead of the training hat for just a second. Uh, anybody from Oklahoma? Any, any Okie? One Okie, um, a couple of Okies. You might remember uh, Chief uh, Chad Corncastle Smith. He was the principal chief of Cherokees uh, a number of years ago. And he was a wildly successful chief. And part of the reason why he was so successful is he was very clear on the three things that the tribe was going to work on. And it was uh, maintaining culture, it was providing uh, economic opportunity for uh, for tribes members, and it was investing in the communities that they, that they lived in and existed in. And any time he spoke, that's what he talked about, right? It was, it was this consistent messaging of this is what we're going uh, to do. Well, from an OD perspective, then our, object, our our goal, if you've got that kind of clarity in your organization of this is who we are and this is what we're going to do, then our job is to come in and say, then what do we need to be good at to do that? Right? What do we need to be good at to achieve what we're trying to achieve? Uh, and once you've answered that question, then you build learning and training and uh, and resources and tools and programs to support what we need to be good at. But if your organization hasn't solved that first level, then it's really hard to build good training. So you got to, before you do good training, you've got to put on your own head and say, let's make sure we know what we are trying to achieve, how we're trying to differentiate ourselves. And then once we've done that, what we need to be good at, and then let's build uh, learning and training that supports it. Right, over and over and over again. Right, I love that. There are layers to it as well. I think there's the foundational, the competencies, the values, those things don't change very often. Um, they should be solid enough to remain consistent for a while, but the, the flavor of the year of what's that goalpost for the business, that changes uh, a lot, I'll just put it that way. Um, so I think it's it's maintaining that, that layered approach of training of, okay, we, we know what our leadership skills need to be, we know what our values are, we know that narrative we need to work toward. But then it's laying on top, okay, is there a theme for the quarter, for the month, for, for whatever structure you need to base your business of what is leadership focused on? Um, for instance, at Tyson, we're, we're layering in a quarterly theme of what is our leadership talking about? And it's talking about thinking globally, it's talking about belonging, it's, it's talking about those things that are important at the moment and having those mechanisms to have some flexibility. That's a good, good segue to... Uh, I like that you mentioned OD, that's for development and change is my passion. Uh, so how can HR professionals effectively communicate, manage change within the organization? You're dying. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody here have a background in communication? <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I am not an HR professional. So um, what some of you, I'm like, OD, OD, what's an OD? Just to be totally honest with you. But I do know a little bit about communication. Um, I mean, to me, again, I, and I, I'll be consistent, you have to lead with the why and the purpose for this. You cannot skip that. Even if you're talking about quarterly trends that are going to change all the time, somehow, the power of language, Right, the beauty of language, the beauty of humans is that we can make sense out of nothing, right? So we actually have the ability to make sense out of things that, let's be all be honest, sometimes no sense. Why is this the priority of this quarter, right? That is the power of communication that we can work real hard to figure out. And it's on us to do that, to take things that are 
maybe passing trends. They just, someone just came back from a conference. We all know that that happens. Everyone goes to a conference. And next thing you know, this is the priority for our organization, right? But your values, to your point, and your overall organizational narrative should not change, right? It should be flexible enough that it can allow for those kinds of, you know, changing priorities. But I would say this has to be embedded and integrated at all stops in the organization where that training is going to have impact. And so your managers, your line leaders, wherever, have to understand why that training happened and then be able to reference it, to connect it to what's happening in real life, right? And that, to me, also means cultivating a culture of listening, right? So you can say that this training is for this purpose, but if your participants come back and don't understand that or had a different experience, then it doesn't matter what you say in terms of your, you know, formal infrastructure of communication. So really scripting out what you want the experience to be, right? And making sure it's the right characters who are going to drive that narrative and you're going to drive those stories and doing the work ahead of time to basically embed that into the training so you can guarantee it's going to happen. Like Ezra once you said that human beings are reverse entropy machines. So that's basically what we do is create sins out of chaos. Anyone else on that question? Because I have an example of very effective communication that I'd like to cite. I was I was thrilled when I discovered that all of the men uh, that participated in this roundtable panel received and adhered to the communication regarding the hairstyle they all needed to attend. So, so that was fun. Now, can you imagine the resistance to that piece of communication had I communicated that to everyone on the panel, right? So speaking of resistance, how can HR professionals manage resistance to change and mitigate negative impacts on employee morale and productivity? I think it's going to come back to communication. And, um, when change is coming, that part of the change that you can share needs to be shared carefully, concisely, honestly, and authentically. Um, and then people make their own sense out of what it is they're hearing. And sometimes that sense will tell them, this is no longer the place for me. Or this is a new opportunity for me, but it's how they hear what it is that we communicate. In my experience over the 40 plus years I've been in the HR world, no one hears the same thing the same way ever. And you need to be prepared for that. And if I may add on to that, it is important that leaders inside the organization like you got to do your yourself talk right you got to get all of your angst about whatever that challenge or change is you got to get that out behind closed doors right as a leadership team um, you have to you want to be sharing the same sort of message right my style of communicating it may be a little bit different but overall the message should be very consistent Right, because if folks see even the slightest bit of a crack, <laughs> that is going to spread like crazy, like a crack on your windshield. Right, so it's very, very important that um, when we're communicating what the change is, why the change as well. Right, so that folks, and again, having that consistent message across uh, your leadership or your change champions. Right, you need to be sharing a, a very similar, very consistent message. Sarah gave us another huge key, right, already, which is change can happen to people or with people, right? And if it's happening to people, they will resist. And if it's happening with people, then they will participate. So there's got to be a communication feedback loop. Uh, Dr. Maddox, you're probably familiar with the, the uh, change management story that came out of World War II about alternative meets. I don't know if you recall this. But uh, in, uh, in World War II, uh, the US government was trying to send all of the best quality protein, or I some person, our quality protein, uh, to the front lines, uh, which meant that they needed uh, American households to consume alternative meats, such as organ meats, right? Which nobody really wants to eat. 
Uh, and so uh, they first started with a massive ad campaign, right? And here's how you're doing your patriotic duty by eating heart and liver. And, uh, and nobody did it. <laughs> I fell flat. So instead, they brought uh, housewives together and asked them and said, here's the challenge that we're trying to solve, right? Here's the problem that, that we're good people that are trying to fight a war. Here's the war that we're uh, that we're fighting, and here's one of the problems that we're running into. What solution can we provide? And they uh, and they organically identified. Well, here's one potential solution. Uh, you know, we could start uh, moving our protein choices. And and as they would die, uh, have that conversation with the house, they would zero in on that and say, "Well, tell me more about what that would look like. How would you go about doing?" It? And they found that uh, that uh, conversion rate to alternative meats was infinitely high when they went through that kind of process of change management versus very slick ad campaigns with Uncle Sam pointing at them saying eat liver. Well, that aligns perfectly with what, uh, what Dr. Thatcher Perry was talking about, mm -hmm. asking them what question and reframing the problem. And I would like to mention something. I think upper management should understand that change does not always only affect employees, but it can affect their career development and their families. Mm -hmm. And and again, respecting their decision. Is this change good for me, for my family or not? And the representative from Tyson mentioned that they decided to relocate so many employees and to the Northwest Arkansas. Imagine it's a big change for those families as well, not only for employees only coming on the way, living their lives to school. So I think respecting people, employees' decision is too, like, change, change is actually always happening, right? And so and sometimes we decide that we want a particular change, but change is always happening. And I would say one thing I, I find in my work too is that in order for that to be a real invitation in the co creative process, we might say, you have to feel agency and a sense of optimism. One that, like, change, this is the right change for this issue. And I actually am excited about it and I can do something. Right. And that kind of sense of agency and optimism is being is being crafted, is being shaped all of the time. So are you doing the stuff in the middle, in between those big changes that is giving that are giving your own place a sense of agency and a sense of optimism? Because then you can tap into that when the time comes for something much bigger that they may feel like is either impossible or is being coerced rather than um, invited. Thing I've noticed too is the need for someone said earlier, I think, but the, the authenticity and just clarity from leadership of addressing we know this is hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think oftentimes it happens to where leaders present it and it's all the, the positive and all the flash, and that can immediately be taken as a negative of well, you're not addressing the obvious here and what it's doing to, to me, my family, and those sorts of things. So I think having that authentic and genuine upfront and saying we helped. We hear you, and here's what we're going to do to, to support you through that. Our listening strategy and that and on that. That's huge. I just want to add, Matt, that um, speaking of meats, and we have somebody with ag backgrounds. I did my grad work at Nebraska, very strong ag program. They invented soon after World War II a, uh, a canned meat process called, it was abbreviated. Um, uh, specialized process meat. <laughs> we know it as same spam. Uh, so from the press. <laughs> so cholesterol, high blood pressure. That comes with a, a can of sodium. <laughs> I want to shift gears to um, one of the questions around networking. So, what strategies? Can uh, HR professionals, HRD professionals use to build relationships with key stakeholders within their industry and professional communities? Well, that's a mouthful. Well, as the SHRM representative, the NOARC <laughs> representative sitting on the panel, I'm going to give NOARC and SHRM and for the people in Oklahoma, their um, chapter for the SHRM. Um, that um, that is one of the best ways for our individuals to um, have network, to have contacts, to have opportunity for growth. 
um, within um, a chapter, you can become a leader, even if you're not recognized as a leader yet in your own organization. You can take leadership roles in your chapter, try them out, see how it feels, position yourself for opportunities within your organization because of those experiences. And um, I, I can't say enough about being part of a chapter of the Society for Human Resource Management. It has so embellished my career over the um, years, and it's an integral part of who I am and what I do. Um, I'll also give a plug for um, ATD, formerly ASTD, for those of us in the um, HRD space, that is um, equally, if not of greater importance to the networking of our lives. Just a uh, I was going to say, I think in the, the business space, your stakeholders within the operation have to know that you understand their business before they'll hear you. They have to feel as though they're understood before they'll try to externally try to understand where you're coming from. And that goes in any relationship, but I think from an HR perspective, um, I've been an HR lady before, HR business partner, and HR doesn't always get the, the razzmatazz when you walk in the room. They're like, okay, the HR's here, cool. Uh, so you have to build a relationship. So you, you can't just be seen as walking the floor and only there when it's a bad thing. Uh, you have to build those relationships and actually extend the hand and say, I'd love to go grab a coffee with you. I'd love to understand your business better and ask genuine, curious questions about that, make them feel understood, not just for the feeling's sake, but it's going to educate you as well. Because at that point, they will reach out to you and you'll get something more proactive versus the reactive on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> so it's a two-way street there, but you have to build that and you have to reach out. I would also just a suggestion as you're approaching networking, which can feel icky, right? It can feel kind of gross to feel like oh, I'm, I'm plan handing and trying to build my network. Uh, I try to approach it as uh, as a little bit like uh, matchmaking. When I'm networking, I'm trying to think constantly about someone else I know that can help solve the problem that we just talked about that you have. Right. So if I'm, you know, I'm I want to be curious. I want to try and find out if I'm as I'm networking. I want to find out what. And this goes internally as well as external. What you're struggling with, what you were, uh, what problems you're trying to solve, and if I know somebody that can help with that, let me connect you two. Right, and that way, uh, I'm I'm the virtuous middle person. Right, I haven't uh, I haven't uh, I'm not hoisting my uh, my credentials or my wonderfulness uh, on uh, on this new person. Instead, all I'm doing is helping them solve a problem with a, an expert or a resource that I know. Uh, so I found that to be incredibly valuable as I approach networking, because I don't particularly enjoy uh, the networking aspect, but I really enjoy helping solve people's problems and, and pulling on uh, friends and colleagues and, and other experts that I know or that I've met that can help solve people's problems. Two, four. You know, networks also have a habit of being echo chambers, right? And so we, our networks are not as diverse <laughs> as sometimes we like to think they are. And so, as we talked about, a lot of times the way we understand a problem is just full of our own bias about why that problem exists. So really being intentional about, you know, finding networks that you are just not maybe the assumption that you would have thought that's where I belong or that's where I go and really forcing yourself to surround yourself with people who actually may have a very different understanding of that problem, which is going to lead to a much broader range of potential solutions. So um, in a lot of the space I work with, employee resource groups are great for that. Listening, you know, that should be happening. Um, but yeah, look for those conferences, look for those networks that just make be those places where you might feel a little uncomfortable, might be a little out of place. Um, I think it's very valuable. Can we explore that topic a bit more? So how do you ensure that your network is diverse and that it, you know you, you have different perspectives or perhaps even consider what kind of psychological implications there are to that or what you should be looking at in yourself to ensure that that's happening? 
recent exercise that I've done in a leadership course before, where it's asking you to write down four different categories. You can just put their initials however you want to do it, but the categories of uh, those that you went to school with and those that are out of that list, who is married, who has a certain education level, what kind of culture are they from, et cetera, and just literally map it out, write it down on who your circle of individuals are and what those different notations are that assign to them. And you'll very quickly realize they all look the same. Either it's all the same education, all the same marital status, all the same culture background, whatever that might be, and they might not all align, but you'll find a theme. And I think that can be a great place to start just to say, okay, that is an opportunity for me to get out of my comfort zone. I know something I've done of late is uh, with the world of social media, I purposefully follow pages or follow, uh, you know, thought leaders who have a very different view of the world myself, right? Um, and it helps me to not only, you know, you didn't tell me, I'm not kidding. It helps me to challenge my own thoughts, right? My own thought processes, my own um, ideas around things, right? Because then I'm opening up that view. And while that's not necessarily networking, it is for me, someone I do not enjoy networking, right? Um, but it helps me then um, to uh, Dr. Matthew's point um, that I can connect other folks to those resources. Um, and I love doing that because I like helping people, right? So. I think I heard in your question though too, a little bit of um, just self-reflection and, and awareness of your positionality, right? How do you show up in those spaces? And, you know, I think a lot of, I'll just speak it from someone in kind of dominant culture, white woman in a lot of spaces, like I, I show up a certain way, right? I show up and I feel like my opinion is worth hearing and I'm going to share it freely. And that is not always how to show up when you're actually supposed to be assuming a posture of humility and curiosity and, and also to recognize that others may not feel the same safety, right? To show up in places where they are a minority or kind of feel minoritized in that space. So there's a lot of reflection that has to happen here. There's a lot of nuance in terms of feeling out situations. Maybe it's best that I actually just sit and read and do my own work for a weekend or a year or maybe 10 years, you know, um, before, before entering out. And so I just want to acknowledge, I heard a little bit of that sensitivity in there, and I, I don't want to bowl over the fact that you just walk into any spaces and I'm, you know, I'm here to listen, but in fact, I'm going to talk the entire time. So. I got curious, curiosity, right? And had an inter had a a scary and, and interesting experience this Christmas, this holiday season. Uh, my uh, I bought a a uh, sweater for my spouse, and I thought I was buying a gray sweater. Uh, and uh, and then she opened it and said, "This is a lovely hunter green sweater." <laughs> I said. No, that's, not, that's a gray sweater. And she said, no, that's Hunter Green. And I turned to my children who were with me when I bought it and said, gray? And they said, no, we just thought you liked that Hunter Green sweater. And so I ran to my closet to pull other things. And I was like, gray. I said, is this gray? No. And I said, you've been letting me dry, you know, dress like a Christmas tree for years. I don't realize it. And, uh, and so... Unconscious bias works a lot like that, right? There's no possible way for me to ever learn about it unless I ask it. And, and there's two ways that I can respond to the feedback. I can respond to the feedback as all of you are crazy and I'm the only one seeing color correctly, or maybe I've got a blind spot, right? Maybe there's something uh, going on in my vision that I never realized before. And so the only way that I'm going to learn about it is now I have to hold stuff up to my kid, wife and kids and say, what color is this? And am I, and I'm like, do I match? And am I going out looking, you know, uh, like a forest? Um, <laughs> but it's it, all of that curiosity and humility is necessary in that dialogue around, around bias as well. You've got to acknowledge 
that your way of seeing the world isn't the only way of seeing the world, and you don't have access to that other perspective, so you have to ask for that. And so uh, I think as you're as you're looking at your networks, uh, it's uh, if everyone is seeing the color the same way you are, then you're probably not asking enough people. A little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important. Um, I'm someone that can be a close colleague, friend, um, whatever position you need to feel that is an opposite of yours in some form or fashion. I've gone further faster in my career because my colleague and I, she is the other side of my brain. We are so opposite. It's funny, but we work so well together in the fact that I lean on her strengths and she leans on mine. Uh, so it can go in uh, multiple perspectives and ways, but surround yourself with those folks that will actually help you out if you open it. That brings to mind the whole idea of mentoring, too. Mm -hmm. That the kinds of mentors that you choose or you line yourself up with, if it's a mentor that is just like you and yes, 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 you will only go so far. But if it's someone who's going to challenge you, who may be different, um you're going to experience different things together than you would if they were just like you and um people who sat through my session know that my uh boss sitting up there in the back is um is my mentor and if you look at us you realize there's a bit of a difference in our ages <laughs> so, but i would not be surviving and thriving right now in what i'm doing I know I'm listening to the things that she can help me see differently. I'd like to remind everyone that we're focusing on three topics, training and development, change management, and strategic networking, and open up the floor to questions for the panel from anyone here or online. Don't everybody speak once. <laughs> I got one. Um, most of you are in positions of leadership and uh, you have the ability to affect change directly. Um, but thinking from a perspective of superiors, uh, sometimes I run into the position of people who are willing to listen, but not necessarily affect change, especially when we're talking about types of DEI initiatives. So what are your recommendations for helping people, helping to move the needle when you've got people who are willing to hear you, but not make changes? I'll tell you, I'm sorry. No, yeah. uh, something that I've sort of lived by um, is the understanding that maybe I'm planting seeds, right? So while you're not getting that immediate uh, you know, change, each time you're having that conversation or you have an opportunity to revisit the conversation uh, around things like DEI in particular, right? You don't realize how much you might be planting seeds for that person, right? That then they go and they read an article that waters that seed, right? Or they have a conversation with someone else that continues to water that seed. And before you know it, they're coming back to you asking, so tell me more about this. Right? Um, I've had this, this or that experience, right? So um, understanding and meeting people where they are, right? And even though I may be, I'm, I'm ready for it to be here, right? And they're still at the starting point, meeting them where they are and just sharing the information can do a world of good that we don't even think about, right? Because we're already thinking down the line. So I would encourage you not to be um, disappointed when that happens. Like I want things to change today <laughs> when I bring it up, but it may be next week or next year. And I have to just continue um, to operate in that sort of mindset of hope and education. I think too, if you've watered that relationship with them and you can eventually get to a place where you can ask them the hard question of what are what could we potentially be fearful of in in executing this? Because ultimately if, if people act or don't act, it's usually from a place of fear of something. Uh, so I think the times I've run into that with a leader and upper leadership, 
and it can feel like you're talking to a wall. I think once you build that relationship, like I talked about earlier, before you get to the crucial point, you're able to then ask them, what do you, what, what would you be fearful of going down this path? Because then they're going to open up to you all the things that motivate them, why they do or don't act, and then you can start to pick those apart as well and help them. Can I put a panel member on the spot? Look at Sarah. I, I, I'm thinking about change that like people don't change when they get facts. It's it's the narratives. So can you talk a moment about that? Because I think yeah, I think it's the king. I mean, particularly when we're talking about DEI, that the work of DEI cannot fall on one person or well, one team. I mean, it just <laughs> and so I think. I'm going to say a few things is that those of us who are convinced that this is meaningful and important and necessary and oh wow it should have happened a long time ago have to also practice curiosity in ways that are not maybe comes easy to us right now and I may be here on this journey but I can't forget where I was 10 particularly you know for me I can't forget how I was 10 years ago. And I gotta remember how to nuance maybe the language and how to talk about it so that I can meet people where they are. Because I didn't go from here to here overnight. And yet when we get to here, we expect others to do that. Very hard to balance because there is there is real impact to not making these changes fast enough, right? But I think what Jim is getting at, particularly when we are talking about really difficult, uncomfortable, polarizing, partisan type of topics now, the, the problem solution kind of framework just does not work, right? We really have to dig into our own experiences and begin to know our network who also can maybe lean in on their own experiences, right? I'm pulled into conversations that someone said, oh, this person needs to hear from Sarah. They need to hear what she went through, who can say this, talk about DEI in a way that doesn't even use the words DEI, doesn't use the word privilege, doesn't use the word race, right? So I think getting into this habit of listening and sharing our experiences with DEI then allow us to kind of tap into that reservoir of compelling communication that can actually move people a little bit further. Maybe not from seed to full on like sunflower stock, you know, but at least start moving the needle. Um, and it's also figuring out who, what needles do you really need to move and when? And really understanding that, because it's not everyone all at once. It usually isn't, but really figuring out who, who do you need to move, how and when, and looking at all of your social capital and networks to figure out a pretty advanced strategy to do that. We had a uh, an executive in our organization who was who was outly proudly a member of the LGBTQ community who we were shocked, pushed back incredibly hard when we tried to include uh, conversation around pronouns in our NEL in our NEL program. We were shocked. I thought for sure this individual is going to be a huge advocate and champion for uh, for this change, and he did not want to do it at all. Uh, and so it forced us, it forced me to get curious and find out why, right? Why? Uh, and and it was he had very valid reasons. It might not be, you know, it might not. Eventually, those reasons are going to be too low. And we're going to need to find solutions around uh, those reasons. But uh, it forced us to step back and go, we thought this is going to be an obvious advocate. Well, no, he's not an obvious advocate. He's got really good reasons for not being an obvious advocate. And we got to go find that. Yeah. And if I can tie something together based on what Sarah said the, and networking, there are things that you can enter a room and say that I can never say. Right, that's going to reach someone who looks more like you, right? Versus me just coming in and telling my side or that sort of thing, right? So the importance of creating or having those relationships with the folks who are different from you, who may then reach someone who is more like them, right? That's very important too. And, I, and I'm thinking about this, especially around the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Um, 
that is work that we are just getting, in my mind, just getting started with doing since the pandemic um, inside of our organization. And at night, I sometimes worry about the person that we have in that chief diversity officer seat because she looks like me, but she's going to enter rooms with folks who look more like the rest of the panel or those in the audience, right? And how much of a challenge that is for her. Um, and to Sarah's point, she can't do it all alone. She is going to need, and I'm getting the card here, she's <laughs> going to need to tap into resources, right, that look different than herself. Um, and that is so, so crucial and so important that we realize those things, right? And it doesn't even have to be around DEI, it could be something else. But, um, I, okay, so the folks who were in my session, you know, I'm, I, I tell narratives, right? I share my story. Once upon a time, I worked in public health and I worked as a tobacco cessation analyst. And I can't tell you how many times I would be presenting or talking about smoking cessation, uh, cessation and someone would say, well, have you ever smoked? No, right? I couldn't connect with them in the way that someone who is a former smoker could, mm -hmm. right? So I instantly lost credibility with them, right? Because here I am, this young kid who studied it telling them all these things, right, without that lived experience. So the pillar of communication is the messenger is the message. Yeah. So think really hard about the messenger when it comes to the kind of message that you need to be transmitted um, and, and understood and then act on. Oh, I have a question. Just looking over my notes and the Philadelphia student. <laughs> Um, a common theme that came from every session I was at um, and the keynotes today was about telling a story of some sort, whether it was through data, culture, different generations. So my question is specifically, what advice would you have to give HRD professionals um, strategies that you might use in the workplace to get these stories? So like, mm -hmm. you, like you said, you asked a question and that just happened to come up. But there are so many other stories out there. How can we capture those stories and then use them effectively for change? You have to be. You have to create a culture where stories get championed. Uh, so, uh, in our organization, one of the things that we do is uh, we couch it as our award and recognition program. But it's really a, a key pillar of our employee value proposition, which is uh, how do we how do we create a brand, talent brand of uh, of individuals who uh, who espouse our culture and our values and and our mission? And we do that through stories. We do that through constant storytelling. And so uh, there's a snowball effect to storytelling. Right? But once you create a framework to say, here's kind of the stories that we're looking for, and here's some great examples, amazing examples, and I bet you. Know five other people that can uh, that have amazing stories uh, as well, and and tell us those so that we can champion those and get those out. You get you get a virtuous cycle at that point of uh, where stories amplify stories. But you have to create that culture. You've got to create a really clear framework of what kind of stories you're looking for. Uh, I think before you start actually looking for stories, evaluate the environment. Is this a safe yes, environment for those people to come and share? Right. They all have stories, but yeah. are they going to step up? Right. 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 Yeah. And it means looking for the stories that you don't want to hear. Yeah. Right. right. That's just as important because those stories are going to be a lot more impactful than the ones that are more the improved, kind of the amplify the narrative that the company wants or organization wants. Right. But if you aren't listening for the stories that actually might be counter to what you're saying, then you can't make the changes to resolve it, right? But just one thing to think of too, anytime I used to talk, anytime you ask a question, what happened, you're going to get a story, right? So just sometimes we want to like, well, I don't know how I'm going to get a story. Just ask someone what happened and a story will come forth, right? Um, something little that I've seen um, when you're just starting this too is in meetings or wherever, whatever kind of convenings are happening, you know, people can get really like, again, to your point, that it's not safe for people to share a lot. So being very mindful of that. But 
one question, even at the beginning of meetings, that has revealed so much about people's lives and experiences is what's an obstacle to your listening right now? Like we all come into something thinking about, oh my gosh, uh, I've got a kid in Tulsa who right now is probably going to have an asthma attack because he forgot his inhaler and I'm super stressed out about that. But I got to deliver this 45 minute panel conversation. Like, what if he calls me in the middle of that and I can't answer that? That's real. That's my life behind the scenes. That tells us a lot about everything that's happening with our employees. And just by asking, hey, we're all busy, we got a lot going on, just let's all go around. What's one obstacle to listening today? Name it, release it, and man, you walk out knowing a heck of a lot about the people in that. In our organization, healthcare safety is crucial. Right? We're always we're constantly evaluating and pushing for patient safety. And so, what we've adopted in a lot of organizations is what's called a safety hub. We come together every day, and what you do is tell stories. And you don't just tell success stories, you tell near miss stories. You tell stories about, uh, about uh, accidents that did occur and uh, and why they occur and what we learned from them. All right, so you create this culture of where it is safe to talk about near misses because that's oftentimes what people don't want to talk about is, man, this almost went horribly, but I caught it at the last second. Well, then let's dive in and understand what happened and why and and what was the mechanism that kept uh, that uh, was in place and how do we make sure that that mechanism but it is it is creating place and space for the, for that conversation to happen. I think leadership has to also acknowledge and make it safe to share those those misses or those failures or those sorts of things. You you have to reward that because that's the only way you'll get more people to share. Uh, this is a failure I had. Here's what I learned. I want to share with all of you so you don't make the same mistake. That sort of thing. Uh, because if you don't reward that, then people just hold on to them. They won't share. We have about five minutes left. Uh, are there any other questions in the audience? So in speaking to change and curiosity and everything, how would you navigate wanting or asking for that type of transparency from individuals on a lower level? So not in leadership, but more in that middle management or frontline worker. What does that look like and how would you use that information and have them understand that it's a safe way, you know, a safe space to do it um, when past practices don't have shown them otherwise. What does that look like? How do you navigate that? Or could you, I guess? Mm -hmm. the, the key to what you just said is when past practices show that there is no reward for that, mm -hmm. that puts a whole fly in the ointment right there. And mm -hmm. um, and I get concerned that that is out of your control. So it's going to take a long time to build a culture that says to your middle managers, this is safe. In our organization, we, we made some pretty radical changes around our employee engagement survey process because historically the employee engagement surveys are off, right? Let's just, let's just be honest. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why they're bad, uh, but we uh, we blew up that process. One of the things that we did is we survey more often now. But the very first question uh, of the of the subsequent survey, so we uh, survey, and then the very first question of the next survey is: Think about the last couple of months. Did your leader have a conversation with you about the last survey results? And it's a yes, no question. There's no hiding from it. You either did or you didn't. Right, and uh, and we found something really fascinating in our data. Right, we call that an action checking question, uh, and we found something really fascinating. First, fascinating thing is there's a direct correlation between action check in and engagement. Right, so action check in is high, engagement is high. What, as we looked at it longitudinally, what we found is no. Even if we mixed up the questions and asked different questions, if that action check in was high. Engagement improved over time, regardless of the questions that we ask. So, in, in other words, simply the act of leaders having transparent, meaningful conversations with their teams about the things that they cared about and then taking action on that conversation improved employee engagement. 
questions are the least important for, I'm sorry, we don't have any IO site folks. <laughs> the questions are the least important part of the engagement survey process. The most important part of the part is the conversation that happens. So you've got to take, you've got to take very baby steps and let me show you that we're going to take even if it's one uh, one action that's based on your feedback, you want a potluck every you know once a month. We'll have a potluck one. Go ahead and see if you've got to tie it back. You said that you wanted this, and so we did it. And now here's the result. We do that over and over, and over and over and over again, regardless of the questions that you're asking, and you build trust. Well, let that be the last word in the panel discussion. I'd like to give our panelists a round of applause. to remind everyone that oh first are, is there any are there any questions from anyone online all right then i'd like to remind everyone to scan the qr code on the back of your brochure to provide feedback about the panel discussion we have poster presentations immediately after and there should be a whole new round of food out there yeah Yay. i know but we're going to say you can grab some and take it home. There's an abundance of food, and so we're going to share. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, we also have um, uh, the Noark Sherm represent representative uh, available for questions, correct? Yes, and also Dale Clinton and um, Kathy Hoffman are my colleagues in the one. Wonderful. So with that, thank you all, and I invite you to adjourn to the foyer. Doctoral students that have a poster, if you want to hang by your poster for just a little bit, see if anybody has.